let's talk about the Bible. The word Bible just means book. It comes from the Greek word biblios, which means book or scroll. And you know, so far so good. It's definitely a book. Uh, but in some ways, calling it a book might be a little bit misleading. This is the thinnest version of the Bible that I have. They've made it pretty small. And they've done that through a range of different things. First of all, it's got what you call, you know, the Bible pages. They're super smooth and super thin. They don't take up a lot of space. And the text is really small. And it comes in two columns, so there's four columns on a page, and all together you end up with a book that's easy to carry around with you. You can take it to Bible study, it's not going to break your back. It's good. However, here, oh, they're heavy, is Robert Alter's translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And they have much more normal, what we think of as normal uh, Bible, I mean, book stuff. You've got uh, larger text, normal paper, normal margins. It's a little bigger than uh, it might actually be because there's extensive commentary, uh, or footnotes rather. Uh, but you get a sense, right, of how big... This is just the Old Testament here, these three volumes. You get a sense of how just enormous the Bible would be if they were all written the way we normally print just books. And this brings us to an important point, right? What you can maybe start to guess from these volumes of the Old Testament that you might not guess from this little Bible is that the Bible is not nearly so much a book as it is a library. And that's an important point. The Bible is made up of a lot of different books written by different authors at different times. And what they have in common is that God has chosen to use them and speak through them to us, and to his church, to tell us something about who he is and who we are and who we're called to be. The Bible is a living library. And that's an important point because libraries, we treat libraries much differently than we treat books, right? Uh, books don't usually change genres uh, in the middle. Uh, but when you walk into a library, you're aware of the fact that in this one library, you have, uh, you have history books, you have science fiction books, you have, you know, how-to or self-help, there's poetry, there's kids' books. You know when you go into a library that when you pick up a book, you're going to have to look and see what kind of a book it is. And that's the same way the Bible is. If we think of the Bible as a book, we might be tempted to think that everything in the Bible is the same kind of thing. It's the same genre that you treat it all alike, that you read it, interpret it all alike. But just like you wouldn't read and interpret a book of poetry the same way you read and interpret a book on, you know, the solar system, you can't walk in, figuratively speaking, to the Bible and think that everything in it has to be read and interpreted in the same way. The Bible has ancient history, but it also has poetry, the Psalms, and it has wisdom literature, uh, the, the Proverbs, among others, which is kind of like the ancient equivalent of the, of the how-to or self-help books, self-improvement books. There's prophecy. There, there are letters. There's just, there's uh, what you might call uh, parables or fables, stories that are told, and they're not meant to be, uh, they're not presenting themselves as history, right? Jesus tells parables maybe about the Good Samaritan. And he's not telling you that there used to be this dude, right? And this other dude over here who helped the other guy. Uh, he's telling you a story. And the story is meant to teach you something about who God is and about how, who you are and about what God wants from you. So we have these in the New Testament. Jesus tells a lot of them. We also have these kinds of stories in the Old Testament in a few places. And they, they don't present themselves as history, 
they're presented as a story, kind of like Aesop's fables. Here is a story that's going to teach you something about who you are, about who God is. And the book of Jonah that we're starting to study this week falls squarely in that category. The book of Jonah is funny. It's uh, unexpected. It's challenging. It's going to turn your life upside down if you let it. Uh, but if you come at it expecting, you know, the same thing you expect if you come at a gospel, you're going to miss the point. Just like if you read a satire or look at a political, political cartoon, the same way you read, uh, you know, the front page of the morning newspaper, you're not going to get the point. So with that said, let's read Jonah, uh, chapters 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Get up! Go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has risen before me. And Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from before the Lord to Jaffa, and found a ship coming from Tarshish, and he paid its fare, and went down with them to go to Tarshish from before the Lord. And the Lord cast a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, and the ship threatened to break up. And the sailors were afraid. And each man cried out to his God, and they cast the gear that was in the ship into the sea to lighten their load. And Jonah had come down to the far corners of the craft, and had laid down, and had fallen deep asleep. And the captain approached him and said, What are you doing asleep? Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give some thought to us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has befallen us. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us, pray, you on whose account this evil is upon us. What is your work? And from where do you come? What is your land? And from what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and the Lord God of the heavens do I fear, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men feared greatly, and they said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from before the Lord, for he had told them. And they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may calm for us? For the sea was storming more and more. And he said to them, Lift me up and cast me into the sea, that the sea may calm for you. For I know that on my account this great storm is upon you. And the men rowed to get back to dry land and were not able, for the sea was storming upon them more and more. And they called out to the Lord and said, Please, O Lord, pray let us not perish on account of the life of this man, and do not exact from us the blood of the innocent. For you, O Lord, as you desire, you do. And they lifted up Jonah and cast him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its fury. And the men feared the Lord greatly and offered sacrifices to the Lord, and made vows. And the Lord set out a great fish to swallow Jonah, and he was three days and three nights in the innards of the fish. And Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the innards of the fish. He said, I called out from my straits to the Lord, and he answered me. From the belly of Sheol I cried out, You heard my voice. You flung me into the deep, in the heart of the sea, and the current came around me. All your breakers and waves streamed over me, and I thought, I am banished from before your eyes. Yet again will I look on your holy temple. 
Water lapped about me to the neck. The deep came round me. Weed was bound around my head. To the roots of the mountains I went down. To the underworld bolts against me forever. But you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. As my life breath grew faint within me, the Lord did I recall. And my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who look to vaporous lies leave out their mercy. And I, with a voice of thanksgiving, let me sacrifice to you what I vowed let me pay. Rescue is the Lord's. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is a story about a prophet who's not super great. And you can tell because he's called Jonah. And Jonah shows up in one of the historical books of the Bible. And he shows up as a prophet to a king who uh, is trying to convince the king that God is saying that the king is going to succeed and have all sorts of wonderful things happen when actually God is saying the opposite, that uh, what the king is about to do is going to fail miserably. So you can tell just walking into this story that this is not going to be about a super brave or super faithful prophet of God. But the word of the Lord comes to him anyway, just like it comes to a bunch of other prophets in the Bible without really warning or explanation. It just says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and it says, get up and go to Nineveh. And uh, Jonah gets up, all right, he gets up and he flees in the opposite direction. I guess the theory might have been for him that God might be something like a Bluetooth signal and the farther away you get from the source, which is Israel, the weaker the connection is and he can just run away, right? And when the storm at the boat makes it clear that this is not going to work out too well, he tells the sailors, just throw him overboard, right? And that, that solves the problem of the storm for the sailors. But also, if Jonah's dead, he really can't go to Nineveh anymore. It's the perfect escape. And being willing to, you know, drown rather than go to Nineveh seems like a bit of an overreaction until you consider that Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which is the country that had wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel and had seriously threatened Judah. I found a Jewish commentator who said uh, that sending Jonah to Nineveh to preach repentance would be something like sending a Jew to 1936 Berlin and asking them uh, to tell the Germans to repent. It's just not, you know, gonna go super well. So even though Jonah says later in the book that he flees because he doesn't want God to forgive these terrible people, which I think, you know, that's a human, understandable response. I think he was also scared. This is a scared, angry, disobedient, resentful prophet of God. And if you think that's not usually how you expect a prophet to be, you'd be right. One of the things this book is doing is flipping on its head the expectations of good religious people about how the world is. And it doesn't stop with just Jonah. We have these sailors. And sailors, you know, they're uh, like, you know, for us, sailors had a reputation of being a little bit rough around the edges. They're not who you'd expect to be devout followers of God who show up for church every Sunday. Uh, and on top of the, that, you know, that reputation, these particular sailors are Gentiles. So they're, they're pagans. They don't even worship the right God. 
So isn't it surprising, it would have been surprising for the first readers of this, of this book, that when this huge storm hits, and the prophet of God is asleep underneath in the, in the you know, downstairs in the boat, the sailors are the ones, these pagans who probably aren't too devout anyway, are the ones who notice that this is, this is a thing from, from the heavens. This is not an earthly phenomenon without help from the prophet. And they're the ones praying not the prophet. And they're the ones who discern who it is that's angered. Uh, they think the gods, but then they find out just one god. And when they haul Jonah up out of the ship, or the, you know, the bottom of the ship, and ask him what in the world he's done, and he's who he is, who he worships, he says, I fear the god who made the sea and the dry land, which, I mean, it couldn't have been that sincere, right? Because he thinks he's going to run away from the God who made the sea on the sea. But they, they don't, they don't, uh, they believe him anyway. They don't let uh, his obvious kind of hypocrisy here stop them from receiving the word of the Lord for them. And they show them their uh, willingness to really hear uh, about God through their unwillingness, first of all, to just throw Jonah off the edge of the boat when he tells them to, and then through their prayer, uh, their, their vow to sacrifice to God, uh, their, their desire to pray to God, uh, and, and then finally uh, their affirmation that God uh, is going to do what God is going to do when they finally do throw Jonah off the end. So these pagan sailors in a lot of ways are behaving uh, more devoutly than God's own prophet does. But there's three characters in this story so far, right? There's Jonah, there's the sailors, and then there's God. And even though God is behaving uh, more like we'd expect God to, there's still things to be surprised about with God's behavior. You know, we have this idea in the church sometimes, we shouldn't, but we do, that the God of the Old Testament is this wrathful, vengeful God, you know, and the God of the New Testament is gentle. Uh, but of course, it's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's plenty of, of anger uh, in the New Testament, and, and the Old Testament is dripping with grace and patience from God. And here we can see that as well. What would you expect if... Uh, what would you expect God to do with a disobedient prophet? A flagrantly disobedient prophet, right? Drowning them in a storm doesn't seem off the table. But even after Jonah is thrown off the edge of the ship, uh, God sends a fish to swallow Jonah. And he keeps Jonah there. It's like, it's like divine time out. Jonah's mad. He's scared. Uh, and he's kept, probably not super pleasantly, but safe in the belly of these fish for three days and three nights. And then he, for the first time in this text, he prays. And is it a great prayer? No. He doesn't say sorry. You know, this is not a prayer of confession by any stretch. It's not even really quite a prayer of repentance, but it's at least a prayer for help. A prayer of faith that God is going to get him through this. And after that, the fish that vomits Jonah up onto dry land. So what we have here, this first half of the story, is not yet a lot of answers. We don't have yet a bunch of doctrine. We'll get there, right, towards the end of the text. But what we have is a systematic shaking up of everything we are inclined to think that we good religious people who know the truth are better than the people who don't know the truth. It shows us that sometimes we can be more stubborn, more hard-hearted than the people we think we're better than. It shakes up our idea about God. It shakes up our idea about what God is doing in the world and who he's able to do it through. 
He can even do it through the religious hypocrites that we like to despise so much. Because even though Jonah didn't really mean to, right, he still acted as prophet to these sailors. And these pagan sailors didn't act like we would expect pagan sailors to act. So what the book of Jonah is doing here, doing here for its original audience and doing through God's spirit for us as well, is shaking us up making us less certain we know what's going on here and in the world and preparing us for the end of the book where the questions get real, real personal. But we will get there next week.